I read a disturbing article this past week that alleged that most of the churches in America are being robbed. It's rather shocking. Not the kind of robbery we experienced recently when someone t- stole our zero-turn mower out of the storage shed in the back. But what was unnerving about it, the article said that robbery was taking place from within. It's members of churches that were robbing the church. And the article went on to suggest that anybody reading the article, it could be happening at your church, even here. It was reported that the money that was being stolen was being spent on vacations, cars, boats, designer clothing, athletics, television, smartphones, electronic devices, and even dining out. And, of course, the article was introducing my text this morning in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You see, beloved, any time we withhold giving as members of the New Testament community... In some sense, we're robbing the church, and the church is the body of the head, so we're robbing Jesus Christ Himself. So today we look at the fifth dispute that God brings to the remnant Israel. We'll just entitle it, Will a Man Rob God? Now you can see once again God's pattern. He confronts Israel's sin with a question or a statement. Israel again objects. How have we robbed you? And then God confronts the heart of the issue. Not just what the hands are doing, but what the heart, the position of the heart. There's a certain kind of heart that robs God, and God is always after our hearts. He's not after your money. He doesn't need your money. We understand that. God is after a certain kind of heart that gives way to a certain kind of giving. That when God confronts us on this issue, He's doing us good. He's always doing us good. So what God is going to do is highlight His faithfulness to Israel in three ways. First, His faithfulness in verse 6 to sustain Israel, even though they've gone away from His ordinances. Secondly, He's faithful to confront Israel's robbery. I have cursed you with a curse. And thirdly, He's faithful to... Bless Israel, prove me herewith, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that you will not be able to receive it. And all nations will call you blessed, and you shall be a delightful land. What does that mean? How are we to take that? Is that a prosperity gospel text that we've overlooked? What is God saying this blessing would be for us today in a New Testament context? Although different from Israel, yet God goes on record to say if we test Him, if we prove Him, some way He's going to bless us today. So first we see in verse 6, which serves as a transition from the previous dispute that we looked at in chapter 2 and at the end of that chapter leading into chapter 3, In verse 5, God says, For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers you have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. So God goes on record to say He's faithful really in two ways. He is faithful in verse 5 to judge unrepentant sinners. There will be a day when God will judge All unrepentant, sorcerers, adulterers, and all that's found in verse 5. Why? Because I am the Lord, I will not change. So God goes on record that when He says He'll judge sin because He is immutable and He doesn't change, therefore God will one day judge all unrepentant sinners. Now that's one direction of God's faithfulness. But the direction God is highlighting for Israel, the covenant community, is the sons of Jacob. Israel, his namesake is Jacob because that's their origin. The sons of Jacob are not 
finished is the word consumed. There's not an end to the sons of Jacob. Why not? Even from the fathers, they've gone away from God's ordinances. Now, he doesn't mean their father and their grandfather and their great-grandfather. He means all the way back to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even when they came out of Egyptian bondage, their devotion to God was short-lived according to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2. When God tells the pre-exile prophet to speak to Israel, speak to Jerusalem and say unto him, I remember your love, I remember your espousals, I remember you going after me in the wilderness. It was a time of love. Israel is holiness to the Lord. God had separated Israel like a, like a young lady separated to a young man in betrothal, in marriage. Where you see these two lovebirds and every time you look they're always holding hands and she's always locked in his arms. God gives that description of Israel when they came out of Egypt and they were in the wilderness in a land that was not sown, but it was so short-lived. Because soon as they came to Mount Horeb and Sinai, they made the calf of gold. And from that point forward, even from the days of your fathers, you've gone away from my ordinances. The idolatry that was under the heart, in the heart, gave expression at Sinai. And for decades, the people of Israel had turned to other gods. Why then is God so faithful? Because He will not change with regard to His covenant. I think about that for you this morning. If God were to change, have you ever had a season when you went away from the ordinances of God? Do you ever struggle with keeping God's commands? Is there any place in your life where you could say that you're not doing, you're not keeping, you're not faithful to God as He is faithful to you? The only reason, beloved, we are here, we can say that we are still trusting in Jesus today, is ultimately God has kept us trusting, and therefore you keep trusting. Our hope is not founded upon our own selves and how we may trust God. Our hope is in the covenant-keeping God. Our hope is in the blood of Christ, for which God says He's faithful. He's called you to the fellowship of His Son, and therefore, faithful is He that called you, will also do it. He will keep you. He will preserve you. He will not change with regard to His covenant. So the whole reason God is speaking to Israel in this text is that he hasn't given on, up on Israel. Not because Israel was so good, they were not. But because God had designed to use this people for a holy purpose to bring about Christ and to bring about the gospel error that we live in today. So, the first thing that God says when he's going to confront Israel is first, I haven't changed. The reason you're still here, the reason you're not finished, the reason I have not made an end of Israel, the reason God has not made an end to you is not because you're faithful. It's because He is Jehovah. He does not change. Therefore, you are not consumed. The second thing He wants as a segue using that verse is that now God will confront Israel's robbery. And you see this in verse 8 again. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, saith the Lord. A curse. So God is going to confront Israel with a curse. Now, first of all, the culprit is the whole nation. In verse 9 he says, even this whole nation is robbing God. The cause of the curse, which we'll look at in a minute, is tithes and offerings. They are withholding the tithe and offering. That's the specific ordinance that God has demanded from Israel. According to the law, even preceding the law, Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. So it even preceded the legalities of the law. They were to give a tithe, and then on top of that, they were to give offerings. Now, a tithe is simply a tenth of all that you possess. But it was more complex than that. 
there are actually three tithes in Israel. The first tithe was to take care of the Levitical priesthood and all the singers. In Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah is in Israel and he learns that the portion for the Levites and the singers has been withheld and they had to go to work. And so he confronts the people, they bring the tithes back in the storehouse, and the Levites get back to doing the ministry of the law of the word in that day. So the first 10% was primarily for the Levitical priesthood. But there was a second annual tithe that went to cover all the seven feasts of Israel. So all the sacrifices, all that was needed for that was a second tithe. But then there was a third tithe every third year that was gathered for the poor. So when you calculate that, every third year for the third tithe, that's about 23% of your income. But it didn't stop there. On top of that, there were offerings, which means contributions. The tithes were compulsory. The contributions were both compulsory and voluntary. This included the sacrifice, the upkeep of the tabernacle on the temple, and even many other things which included, although not tithing, the gleaning of the fields for the poor. So if you're a farmer, which most of them were in that day, you were required to leave the gleanings after you covered the harvest. You didn't go back and gather the grapes and the corn for a second time. You had to leave that as a charitable offering for the poor. So the tithes and the offering for which they were withholding from God, His rightful due, was pretty significant. Now that did include for Israel, since they are a theocratic society, certain taxes were included in that number. Nevertheless, the culprit is all of Israel. The cause is tithes and offerings and now the curse. What is the curse? Well, you see this in verse 10 if we look at the opposite of the blessing. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat or food in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven. So the curse was taking the form of failed crops from two sources. First, a drought. If the windows of heaven will be open, that means the windows of heaven were shut by God. Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the Noahic love, a uh, Noahic flood, in the 600th year of Noah, the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the Lord brought rain upon the earth. So God providentially brought a curse. The curse here is no rain. This Land of Israel needed the earlier and latter rains to have a harvest, and that was shut off. The second form of this crop failure is in verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Devourer means an eater or a consumer. It was likely a crop-destroying pest, like a locust like a caterpillar, like the canker worm, like the palmer worm of Joel chapter 1. What the palmer worm left, the locust ate. What the locust left, the canker worm ate. What the canker worm left, the caterpillar ate. They came in and each had their own diet and what they liked. And one by one, they destroyed everything in Israel. Now here we don't know what the destroyer is as far as the particular insect. But it was something that came in and destroyed the crops. Now here is the likely pattern that took place in Israel. First, Israel withheld portions of the tithe and offering. Then God sent His curse providentially and destroyed the crops. Israel should have spiritually discerned the judgment of God and repented, but rather, what do we do in an economic downturn? When gas prices go up, food prices skyrocket, we use that as another excuse to withhold the tithe and the offering from God. That's what Israel was doing. It was a bad economy. When you have no rain in Israel, the economy tanks. And rather than repent and recognize what God was doing, they said, well, we, we can't give at all, perhaps. 
Because if you're going to keep the vacation and keep the other things going, then the first place likely Israel held back was the tithes and the offering. Now the question is, how would Israel know that? Well, Israel was told from the beginning of their origin by God in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that when they obeyed God in obedience, there would be blessing. And when they disobeyed God in their rebellion, they would be cursing. And God told them through Moses, and it was repeated over and over again by the prophets, that when they saw the windows of heaven shut, that should be a signal to consider their ways. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 28, he said, he would send a curse upon their disobedience. It would affect everything. I'll curse your city and your field, wherever you are. It would affect the kitchen, the farm, and the home. God would curse their basket and their store. The basket there is like the basket you sisters have on your counter that has the fruit and the produce in it, maybe on the island. There was nothing there. The store is an eating trough. It was a rectangular uh, shallow basin where they put the dough after mixing the leaven and they would sit it there to rise. God cursed the kneading trough and the basket. There was nothing there. He would curse the home. He cursed the fruit of their body, their offspring. He would curse the farm. The increase of your cattle, the increase of your kind, the increase of your field was gone. He would curse their health. The fever, inflammation, and the pestilence will cleave to your body. He would curse the weather. The heavens above you will be like brass, and the earth below you will be like iron, dry, nothing. He would curse the army. Your enemies will come in and wipe you out. So for Israel, we apply this to Israel because the, the prosperity of the land is alone tied to Israel and to no other nation. God had given abundant evidence that when they disobeyed, the first thing that would happen would be cursing the field, the farm, the food supply, the harvest. So there was abundant evidence. And as we just read in Haggai chapter 1, and I'll turn back there, that this had happened in the day of Haggai. When they stopped building, clearly they knew God had sent them back as a remnant to build the walls of Jerusalem and then to build the temple. Well, they started building, and because of the Samaritans, they stopped building for 18 years, except the people were saying, it's not time, it's not time to build the house of the Lord. You ever said that? Well, it's, it's just not a good time for 18 years. And the Lord says, is it time for you to build your own houses? Is it time for you to dwell like you're dwelling? And then he says this in chapter 1, in verse 5, Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. So God is now confronting Israel with their livelihood. Then in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Verse 9, You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why? Because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man to his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew. Now what is God saying? You're working, you're working, and you're getting nowhere. You take one step forward and two steps back. Now for Israel, they should have clearly known from the prophecies from Deuteronomy that the reason the heaven was stayed from dew and there was no rain is because they were disobeying a clear command of Scripture. It wasn't something that they would have to try to figure out. It wasn't something they would be perplexed about. They were withholding the tithe and offerings, clearly what God had commanded, and they were not building the temple, clearly what God had told them to do. But how would you know? Again, there are ways in which Malachi is referring to Israel alone and not to America, which we live in a land of plenty, and not to any other nation. God is no longer working through a nation called Israel. He's working through churches. So we can't take... Something said to Israel in the Old Testament and just apply it to something in the New Testament. 
which we often do, like in Chronicles. We say, if my people will hear my voice and humble themselves, I will heal their land. That is for Israel alone. It's tied to Israel and the covenant with Israel in terms of the rain, the early and latter rains, and the fruitful seasons. And he would heal their land and give them rain. But as Christians, we can apply principles of the Old Testament and God's providence to ourselves individually and to ourselves as a church. And how would we do that? We would consider our ways. It means to reflect and to think. So, an economic setback comes into your life. What would you do? You would first simply do the healthy work of thinking on your ways. Is there a clear command that God has been showing me over and over again, and I'm failing to do it? Then we need to repent. Is there something that I've been hearing preached that when I hear it, it's clear that I'm not obeying. I'm not doing what that says. Am I walking out and forgetting it? Or am I repenting and following what the Lord says? See, for Israel, they could just look at the sky and look at what God had said to them about their own land. We can't look at the land. How would you conclude that there's a drought in America that somehow God is judging like He's judging Israel? Yes, God judges nations. He brings temporal judgments upon them. But we can't transfer what happens to Israel to the church today. But we can take the principle and consider our ways. Are you out of the way with the Lord? Is there a way that you're out of His way of His commandments? Are you out of the way with giving? See, if you're not giving at all as a believer, you are out of the way with God and giving. That, that's not hard to figure out, is it? You don't have to scratch your head. Nothing perplexing here. God is going to confront you on that issue sooner or later. Because it's not good for you. To be there. God is going to come to you and confront your lack of giving. There's, if there's no giving in your life, that's pretty clear. Right? Talk about amounts later, right? But if there's no giving in your life and you're a believer, God's going to confront that for your own good. And He calls you to consider your ways. Think about your ways. And then what happened when they did? They repented. This is one of the most glorious texts in the Bible. You know, they said, the Lord has spoken. We've looked at our ways. They went back to building and they completed the temple. God was glorified. The people were rejoicing because they considered, reflected, and took heed to the word of God. So when we think about the curse, we cannot apply this to New Testament church, but we can look at the principles and ask ourselves with regard to giving. And what the Bible says about New Testament giving, am I giving or am I not? And then am I giving as I should be giving? And, or am I withholding for reasons that would be synonymous for the cause of Israel's withholding what was rightfully God's. Now thirdly, in spending the rest of our time on this point, God calls attention to His faithfulness to Israel. That's why He's writing this letter. God calls His attention to confront Israel's robbery. And now God calls attention to His faithfulness to bless Israel. And this is a blessing. And listen to what God says here in Malachi 3. Verse 10, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, because the whole nation was withholding portions. So bring it all. All that God has commanded, bring all of it into the storehouse, which was likely the place. It was all gathered. It was not all monetary. Some of it in the forms of food, crops, things of that nature. Bring it all into the storehouse, so that there may be food in mine house for the Levitical priesthood and all that that was supposed to be for. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. All right. God is clearly motivating Israel 
with a blessing. That cannot be denied. But what is the motivation here? It's kind of a no-brainer. It says, okay, if I make $100 a week and I put $10 in, God's going to fill my bank account full. I mean, we'd all be reaching down deep into the pockets. Is God pandering to Israel? To pander means to gratify someone's desires or their habits. Why is Israel withholding in the first place? We need to ask that question. We'll answer that in a moment. And then secondly, what does it mean to test God? Everywhere in the Bible, God condemns proving Him. He judges it. This is the only place that I know of in the Bible where God invites you and He challenges you to test Him in such a way just to see if He will not do and be faithful to what He says. Pouring out this blessing. Clearly for Israel, it was the prosperity of the land. That cannot be denied. But what is it for the New Testament church? And how do we translate that to the New Testament? And what's different about testing God that's good and testing God that's bad? In Psalm 95, God spoke to Israel and said, Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation, the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted and proved me and saw my work. Forty years I was grieved with this generation and said they always do err in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Therefore they shall not enter into the land of my rest. I swear. And they did not. Now the proving there is clearly a bad thing. If God swears in His wrath that you will not enter into His rest because you tested Him, that's the test It's owing to sin. Or in Exodus 17, when they came out of the Red Sea, they had no water. They chided with Moses at Rephidim. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to cause us to die with thirst? And they murmured against the Lord. And Moses cried out to God. God said, stand upon the rock near Horeb, and I will cause the water to come out after you strike the rock. And there it was called Mesa and Meribah. Because they chided with the Lord and they said, Is the Lord among us or not? The testing that God condemns is a proving God out of unbelief. Is God going to do what He says? Is He going to meet our expectations? Is He going to give us water? Forty years Israel murmured And tested God from a heart of unbelief. Here in our text. The testing. Is God inviting Israel to test him by placing their faith in God. So I want to spend the rest of the time looking at ways in which. Testing God by faith and what that would mean. For Israel, what that would mean for us this morning as well. First of all, faith returns to God. Look at verse 7 again. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? So before we talk about a blessing and what that means, the first thing faith does is return to God as the source of all blessing. He is the source of blessing. Now, why is Israel withholding tithes and offerings? Is God pandering to Israel? Is He saying, look, okay, this is what you want. If you put the store, uh, the tithe in the storehouse, then I'll give you what you want. We don't even do that as parents, do we? Well, you've been crying and murmuring and crying because you want something. Okay, if you'll go clean up your room, I'll give you whatever you want. No, God is not pandering to Israel. He's demanding that they return to God with a heart that seeks God. Now let's just review why Israel 
is withholding the tithe in the first place, we'll see clearly that God, in giving them this blessing, is not pandering to Israel. I have loved you, saith the Lord. Wherein have you loved us? You've not prospered us. You've not given us what we've wanted. You're giving all the other nations what they want, but you won't give us what we want. Okay, bring the tithe in and I'll give you what you want. No, God is not pandering to Israel. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord? To you, O you priest, which despise my name. How do we despise your name? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible, and you bring the mangy, the diseased, and the blind sacrifices. Now why do they do that? Because you can prosper much better by keeping the good stuff for yourself and giving the mangy stuff to God. Is God saying, okay Israel, you want to be prosperous? Give me a tithe and I'll just throw it out of the windows of heaven and give you what you want. Friends, God is not pandering to Israel, nor is He pandering to us. Chapter 2, why were the priests putting away their wives? Treacherously dealing with them, mistreating them. Because they wanted to gratify their own lust. Is God pandering to the priest? Malachi chapter 3, they accuse God of not judging their enemies. God, we think you call the evil good. Now why would you say that? Because they're so prosperous and we're not. Okay, okay, what, what, what you need to do, bring the tithe and the offerings in, fill it up, I'll pour out the windows of heaven, and I'll just give you exactly what you want. The entire book is founded on God not doing that. He's not pandering to Israel. Whatever this blessing is, He's not pandering. And then in chapter 4, when they said, It's vain to serve God. For what profit is it? that we've kept His ordinances, for which they were not keeping. Behold, we call the proud happy, which is the same word for the blessing that God is going to give to Israel. Is God going to play into their hand? Okay, if, you, if you'll just bring the tithe that's rightfully mine, I'll make you happy, and I'll just pour out all of creation's gifts, just like you've been wanting in the first place, which is why you're withholding the tithe in the first place, and I'll give you what you want. No, this is not a prosperity gospel, is it? God is not pandering to Israel. The whole reason they are withholding the tithe is because of self-indulgence. They want the excess for themselves. And if you search your heart, beloved... If you're not giving to the kingdom of God, there's only one reason. Unless you've gone through some disaster, some economic hardship, some wipeout in your own personal economy, which God would allow then for there to be a change in your giving. The reason is only one thing, self-indulgence. And God's not going to pander to self-indulgence. That would be against His glory. Furthermore, in the New Testament, even when the Pharisees did tithe as they were commanded, they were self-righteous. So the self-indulgent says, we don't want to tithe, we don't want to give. The self-righteous says, oh, I'd like to. <laughs> Bring on the tithe, I want to tithe. So Jesus says, you blind guides, Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe all manner of mint, anise, and cumin. Well, they got it just right. Nobody could charge them for not tithing. And have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Luke 11, the parallel text, it was judgment and the love of God. They omitted the love of God. What does God say to Israel? Return unto me. Return to my love. That will cure your self-indulgence and your self-righteousness. So on the outside, they were clean as a whistle. But on the inside, Jesus said, they're full of excess and extortion. Why? They did not love God. So when we withhold what is rightfully God's, particularly in Israel's case, what was the problem that we've learned? They didn't fear God, which means they didn't love God, because they were driven by a me-centered love. And when we are me-centered, we withhold 
giving precisely because we want to indulge on earth's goods. And in that moment, we're not trusting the true and the living God. And if we're self-righteous and we say, come on, tithe, come on, we, we'll go above that, which would be a good thing, what could be the reason? Legalism, which says, what I want is the praise and the glory of men. And that's what the Pharisees wanted, just for someone to see them, counting all the mint and the anise and the cumin, just thrilled them because they were glory seekers, not of the right kind, but of the wrong kind. They wanted to be seen of men. So in both cases, when you're doing it right, it could be wrong. And when you're doing it wrong, it is wrong. Because the root is a me-centered kind of love that loves the praise of men for myself or loves the indulgence of goods for myself. So the first thing before we can ever get this blessing right that's truly a blessing because God said it is. It's truly for Israel, the rain coming down in a fruitful season. Before that ever gets right, there has to be a heart that returns to the love of God. For without the love of God, we are self-indulgent or we are self-righteous. There is no in-between. Without the love of God, I am either self-indulgent with my money or I'm self-righteous. I just want you to see me and say, oh, he's so good. And there's no other way. There's no in-between. Except, of course, a return to the love of God. So when the love of God is present and we're returning to the love of God, money and giving begins to find its rightful place because the heart has found its rightful place with God. Without that, it'll all be wrong. Even when it's right, if that's not too confusing. So faith... The kind of faith that tests God, that places faith in God, comes back to God as the treasure, the source of all blessing, the one whose love is superior than money and all earthly goods. And so that, that's the returning place for us, beloved. That, that's our struggle. That's what we need to be aiming at. And when the love of God is filling our hearts by the Holy Spirit, then our hands will start to open. And it won't be a hard thing where, you know, sometimes you have to pry your hands open. They'll start freely opening for the glory of God. So what's God after in your money? Your good. How is He after your good? Your happiness. How is He after your happiness? His love. His love. The greatest reflection of where your heart is is what you do with your money. I know that's painful. It is for me too. The greatest reflection of the measure of your love of Christ is where your money's going. So if you consider your ways, just, oh, this is hard. Look at your checkbook or your PayPal account, whatever you use. And you'll see really what the idols of your heart and what the idols of my heart are. Right? Oh, God does not need your money. His due is His glory, and His glory comes through His love when we are satisfied, when we are delighted with the love of God more than we are with money. Although we need that. Although the blessing is a real blessing that's to be enjoyed. But not idolatrously enjoyed. That's what God told Israel in Jeremiah chapter 2. He said, I brought you into a plentiful country. Why did you do that? So that you could eat the good of the land. You know, you didn't have to go through... The land of Canaan, like you do with your children in a store, don't touch that, don't eat that, put that back. No, God said, take it, eat it, enjoy it. But then He said this, you defiled my land and my heritage was made an abomination. That's a key word for idolatry. Now, how did they defile a land? Were they, was God an environmentalist that got upset because they were dumping chemicals in the river? Or they were using pesticides to defile the land? No. They enjoyed the land over the fountain, Jeremiah 2.13. They exchanged a fountain for a farm. And they polluted and misused the land as a source of their greatest delight. And they turned from God. So before we use the blessing rightly, 
God calls us to return by faith to Him in a heart that loves Him, that treasures Him, that trusts Him. And I think you'll find money will start finding its rightful place and use in your life. Not without struggle. You'll find you'll be able to be a generous giver if that doesn't describe you this morning. You'll find that you'll be able to let go of what God has given you. He gave them the land. The money is His. He's not just asking for a portion that's His. He's asking, He's demanding your whole life because you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body and your soul, which is God's. He owns you. And He owns our money. And so the first thing faith does, the first test God wants you to pass is, return to Me. Because Israel has gone away from the ordinances, which means Israel has gone away from God. They're drinking from another fountain called money and the love of money. Now, there are two results once we return to God that's going to help us be the kind of giver that God wants us to be. The first thing is, faith in when we test God is going to be free from fear of the future. In other words, if I, if I do what God says in giving and I become a generous giver, what will I do tomorrow? He'll pour out a blessing. See, God is speaking of provision, isn't He? He'll take care of you. Test Him. Like the widow of Sarepta, the city of Zidon, when there was a famine in the days of Elijah. And God sent Elijah to the brook Cherith. And there he was fed by the ravens morning and night because there was water there. And they brought him flesh to eat. But then the brook dried up and he, God spoke to him and said, Go to Sarepta, a city of, of Zidon. There's a woman that I've commanded to feed thee there. Now, she didn't know God commanded her, but he saw when she obeyed the command, she didn't know anything about. So God commanded the widow to provide for Elijah. He gets to the edge of the city. He sees the widow. He says to the widow, Fetch me something to drink and a morsel of bread that I may eat. She said, As the Lord your God liveth. She knew he was a prophet. I'm gathering a couple of sticks. I've got a handful of flour in the bottom of a barrel. That's just right there. I don't have a big hand, but mine may be bigger than hers. A handful of flour. I'm going to bake a cake, we're going to eat it, and we're going to die. Elijah says, yeah, okay, okay, but what I want you to do, you feed me first, and then you go get something for you and your son. Now that's what God is saying here. He didn't say, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to start the rain coming, I'm going to get the locust out, whatever the destroyer is, and then I want you to put the tithe in. No faith in an economic downturn is trusting God. And what did God expect faith to do? You bring it first, and you trust my faithfulness in what I say. And I said, did I not say I'll provide? Put me to the test. So here's what Elijah said to the widow. Thus saith the Lord, The flower in the bottom of the barrel shall not run dry till the Lord sends rain. Now here, get this. The widow then goes back to the barrel. She looks in. There's still a handful there. She sees two things. First, she sees a handful of meal. If that's all she sees, she's in huge trouble. She'll never obey God. Because she'll say, how is that possible? Why would I feed this man? I've got a son here. I'm obligated to feed. The prophet says, feed him. All I have is a little meal in the bottom of a barrel. But she sees something else. She sees the Word of God. And what did God just say? The meal in the barrel will not run dry. So she trusts God. And she makes him a cake. And he ate. She comes back to the barrel. And there's flour there. I, I picture a, a smile coming on her face. is as big as you can see. And it says, they ate many days. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You can't see it. I just see flour. No, you don't. You see a promise. God promised, you will eat. I will provide. I will bless. I will open up the windows of heaven. I will give you what you need. You give it to the prophet. You give as I said. And you put me to the test. Faith has been freed from the fear of tomorrow's provision because faith is resting in a sovereign God that says, I will provide. Now what happens when you don't just see flour, you see a promise, the hand opens. And you can give. 
What happens if you just see flour? <laughs> Be gone, prophet. I don't have enough. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the text we read in this morning. And you see this in the New Testament. We see New Testament principles about giving where Paul will address provision for giving. And the New Testament way of giving and the blessing that's tied to it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, Paul says, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, your liberality. Whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. Paul is pressing the church to make a charitable contribution to the poor saints in Jerusalem. They had committed to it, and now he sent some beforehand and said, I want you to... I want you to Do what you said. Now he said, I could command you, but I want to prove the sincerity of your love. There it is. Return to God. Do you love God? I'm going to prove that by your offering. So that it will be a matter of bounty, not covetousness. What does that mean? What does covetousness do for us? Stinginess. What's happening in Israel? Covetousness. I can't give all that. I won't be able to do Something on Friday or Saturday, right? A matter of liberality, not stinginess or covetousness. So Paul knows the potential. He sends them before. Then he says this, But this I say, He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Now he wants to bring before their attention an agricultural principle. Any farmer that sows a few seeds gets a few crops. But any farmer that sows bountifully reaps bountifully. How does Paul want the church to apply that? Next verse. Verse 7. Every man according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is, make, is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So New Testament giving is purposeful. The word means to bring out of a storehouse. Of course, the storehouse for us is going to be your bank account, presumably, right? Or wherever you have your funds, you may keep them in a jar in the backyard, wherever that is. So you purpose to bring out of the storehouse a certain amount, which should be a proportion. Giving should be proportionate. That's what the tithe is. It's a proportionate amount. It's $10 and $100. Whatever you're giving, it should be regular routine. That's proportion. Just add up your income. You gave some proportion. You purpose, you're to plan it, it's private, it's from your heart, and then you give. Now sometimes there's a lot of discussion about the law has been fulfilled so the tithe is gone, for which I, I could agree with that, I'd say yes, but strangely, Jesus doesn't say much about that like He does the other laws. So the question I would ask myself, if I say, well, we don't have to tithe, I could mean a couple of things. I could mean, well, I'm going to go much less. Well, why would you do that if God were to ask me? Well, Brother Mike, why would you give less? Well, I got some things I'd like to do. Oh, self-indulgence. Well, yeah, I guess that's right. See, be careful when you argue against the tithe. What you're arguing for is self-indulgence. If I give that much, I can't do this. And go back to the love of God. Right? Return unto me. You'll be able to give as you purpose in your heart. So, The tithe may be a good benchmark to start. Certainly God set it up. It's not compulsory in the New Testament. Why not? Wouldn't that be easy? I'd love it if God would have just thrown a number out there. I said, well, that's easy. You know, just just give me a number. Why didn't He do that? Well, in the Old Testament, He gave a number that was written on a stone outside of the heart. In the New Testament, He gives you a law in the heart. In the Old Testament, by and large, Israel hated the law. It was death. I don't want to do this. Every member of the New Covenant community called a believer has a law written in their heart, which means it's a delight. You've been given a heart of flesh, and the heart of stone has been taken out so that you delight in the love of God. And it's a delight to give. Or it should be, right? It's not always a delight. So God doesn't make it compulsory. He says, 
I want you to give on your basis of love. On the basis of the cross. So you purpose in your heart. Furthermore, it should be a pleasure, which we just alluded to, because the storehouse here is not just the bank account, it's purposing out of the heart. And when God sees the heart of the giver, He loves a cheerful giver, which is a joyful giver, someone that's pleased to give, someone that likes to give. He loves a cheerful giver. Because the heart of the giver loves God. God loves the love of God. And the glory of God. And so when we're not being motivated by self-indulgence or self-righteousness, God looks at the heart of the giver regardless of the amount. Because if you're purposing in your heart and it's according as God prospered you, 1 Corinthians 16, then it's going to be different. Your proportion is different than mine. But in all proportions, when it's a pleasure, God looks at your joy and His love and the freedom you have in Christ. And it pleases Him. It pleases Him. Now, we're talking about the provision for the future, so the next verse covers that. There are some New Testament principles on how we give, not law, not mandate in terms of amount, but purposeful, planned, proportionate, private pl- pleasure. Right? Now, here's the provision. Verse 9. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Grace here is referring to two different things. Grace materially and grace spiritually. So you give like the churches of Macedonia, who in a great trial of affliction, the depth of their poverty and the abundance of their joy gave liberally. They were dirt poor, as we say, But out of the abundance of joy in the love of God, boy, they emptied their pockets. Now, it couldn't have been much because they were poor. What were they going to do for tomorrow? How are they going to eat? God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you have all sufficiency, which means enough. The essence of the promise of the blessing in Malachi is God will provide. For your giving and for your food and for what you need. Will He not? The essence of the promise is Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all things should be added unto you. That's the blessing. It's not that we're all going to be filthy rich. God prospers us differently. And our proportion is different. But the love of God is the same for each of us, isn't it? God loves us and He's drawn us into His love. So the grace that God is able to abound towards you when you give bountifully is that you will have all sufficiency for what? To abound unto every good work. What good work? Giving. Isn't that amazing? God's grace comes in the front side and gives you what you need to give and on the back side He gives you more so you can give it again. That's what that text means. The love of God has freed us from fear of the future for provision because our God will provide. He will open the windows of heaven. He will do whatever He has to and needs to to give you what you need to serve Him and to obey His commands because whatever grace demands, grace is able to supply so that you have all sufficiency. Now that's material. That's the material side. What's the spiritual side? The word sufficiency is used three times in the Bible. Once here, once in 1 Timothy 6, 6, once in Philippians 4, 11. Translated in those two places, contentment. I'll just let roll that in your head for a minute. Here, sufficiency. The other two places, contentment. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we should take nothing out. Having therefore food and raiment, be satisfied. How are you going to do that? I don't have anything but God. I have learned whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. Abounding or abased, Paul strives to be content 
with Christ. With Christ. So we can have all the material things to give that we could think about. But if you're not content, what's the opposite of contentment? Covetousness. In 1 Timothy 6, look it up. Covetousness. And covetousness is, is this. It's holding. Because I expect what's in my hand to deliver on my expectation of happiness and being satisfied. Therefore, I can't give it away. So grace comes first to produce contentment as we return to the love of God. Then grace comes materially and just keeps putting a little barrel, a little meal on the bottom of the barrel. So you can give it to the prophet, you can give it to yourself. What is God after? Does He want me to have no joy in the world? He's after your contentment in Him, which is better than money? Really? That's how I talk to myself sometimes. Mike Stewart, really? You thought that was superior than the love of God? And you hung on to it and wouldn't even give it to anybody? Yeah, don't be shocked. That's me sometimes. So the blessing is for the New Testament church provision so that we can abound unto every good work. And then he says, As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. It doesn't mean you give and you get right. Righteousness can refer to almsgiving. How is it that His almsgiving just keeps on going? He keeps on dispersing. He keeps on giving to the poor. His almsgiving remains Because the grace of God remains. And he's content with grace. He's content with God. So he just keeps giving. He just keeps doing it. Over and over and over. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown. Why? Well, here comes the windows of heaven. Seed sown, that's a harvest. Bread multiplied, that's a harvest. To increase The fruits of your righteousness. So that you'd be a giver. See, what God is testing Israel and testing us with is not pandering. I know you've been wanting all these material goods. Just bring in some giving and I'll I'll give you what you want. No, that's not it. God is saying, I want you to be a conduit, not a cul-de-sac. Are you a cul-de-sac? You remember the grounds of a rich man whose ground brought forth plentifully? That's a classic text from Malachi 3. God opened up the windows of heaven. The rain came. The fruit came. He filled his barns. He didn't know what to do. He needed to build bigger silos, so he ripped them down and built new ones. Fine. He's ready to give, right? No. Now say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods for many years laid up. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. God said, you fool, this day shall your soul be required for you. And who shall be all those things you provided? Now what was he providing them for? He laid up treasure for himself. He expected the treasure in the silos to deliver on his expectation for merrymaking, which is just translated happiness. And it failed him. And it will fail you too. And then the text says, he was not rich toward God. Which means what? God is to be for, his love is to be for us what that silo was for that man. Windows of heaven were open. He got the blessing. He is a rich man. But the problem is he's covetous. Because the whole parable was based on covetousness. He's not content with God. He doesn't know the love of God. So he cannot be a generous giver. In fact, he gave none. Beloved, God is testing us first to return to the love of God. So that God is the source of our joy and peace and contentment. And then out of that, he frees us with fear of the future. Because the promises, God says, I'll provide. Seek me first. I will give to you what you need. Whether it's giving or to sustain you. 
unless He calls you home to glory through hunger. And He may do that. Christians can die of hunger. It's not a promise you can't die from hunger. That's the way He chooses to call you to glory. Up until that point, you'll have what you need to serve Him. And then it frees us from the love of money. The love of money. Israel is in love with money. Israel is self-indulgent. So God's challenge is not, Israel, I'll give you what you want if you just tithe. It's Israel, come back to God. And that's what God is calling you to this morning, beloved. Return unto me. Return to my love. Return to my joy. Return to the joy of your salvation. And then money, which you need, will find its proper place. It will just find its proper place as you purpose in your heart to give. Not grudgingly, not compulsory, because God loves a cheerful giver. And then I close with these words. The end of the text. What are people going to say when this happens? And we'll apply this to the New Testament church. What are they going to say? All nations shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord. Now that's not true of any land today. That period is gone for Israel. What will they say? All people that see heritage say, what a delightful church. What a blessed church. What a happy church. Because they found something by the grace of God that money, creation, possessions cannot give us. To be enjoyed by God, given by God, but God aims that the giver be enjoyed more than the gifts. And oh, He's a giver, isn't He? But the giver is supreme. And the love of God is what delights and satisfies our souls. And so let us return to the Lord. If you have not been giving anything, and you call yourself a Christian, and God is calling you to return to His love. If you've been giving bountifully, then God is calling you to stay in His love. Just stay there and keep enjoying the Lord and the pleasure of giving and advancing the cause of Christ. Let's pray.